that what we're declaring today is truth. That there is nothing and there is no one that can even compare to Jesus. His name is above every name. The Bible says that God gave him the name that was above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're just doing that today. We're not waiting for someday. Amen. And that also tells me that his name is above every sickness, every disease, every problem, every, everything you might be up against. There is nothing that he's not over it. So you might have walked in here today feeling a little under it. You don't need to stay under it because he's over it in Jesus' name. Amen? You might, you might even be dealing with something that nobody else knows about. It's okay. God knows all about it. He's got you. He loves you. He's for you. And the Bible says that if God is for you, then who can stand against you? No one can stand against you. Amen? So at all of our campuses that are joining in with us right now, if you're, here, if you're here today and you would say, Todd, I've got something I just need my faith stirred up today. I need to be reminded that God is able and I've got a need that I need God to meet in my life and my family and my finances. It might be a physical need. Would you just extend a hand towards heaven today saying, Todd, include me in this prayer that, that I need God to intervene. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that today we can run to you, Jesus. Your name is above every, every problem every situation that every person in this room might be up against today. You are over it. So Lord, I pray for victory. I pray for healing. I pray for provision. God, I pray that every sickness and every disease, your name is greater than every disease. Your name is greater than the name of cancer. Your name is over it in Jesus' name. Your name is greater than the name of poverty. Your name is stronger. You are a provider. And so Lord, we speak life. We speak healing. We speak the name of Jesus over every person here today. It's in Jesus' name that we gather and sing these songs and pray these prayers. And everybody said, amen. Would you give Jesus one more praise today? Come on. Yeah, you can grab a seat. Man, we're glad you're with us today. I wanna to welcome everybody joining us at all of our different locations and all the men and women in the armed forces joining with us online from around the world. We love you, we're praying for you. Hey, we're gonna do something a little bit different today. I hope that's okay. And if it's not okay, we're still gonna do it. Uh, I'm gonna preach now, and then we're gonna have some time at the end of the message to actually respond to the Word of God. And so I wanna encourage you, don't leave, like when I'm in the closing prayer, you know, don't like sneak out. I may not see you, but God sees you, so don't be going out. <laughs> but uh, you're gonna hang out to the end, and, uh, and, and it's gonna be a good day today. Hey, before we jump into that, I do wanna celebrate what happened here last weekend. We had 960 people get baptized at our church last weekend. How great is that? 960 people making bold declarations of their faith, making declaration statements of, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the resurrection, I believe in the cross. And uh, we shall, hey, Boynton Beach turned the whole Boynton Beach Mall parking lot into a big baptism party out there. Look at that. And uh, everybody driving around the mall had to stop and figure out what was going on. And I'm like, Jesus is going on. That's what's going on in Boynton Beach. And uh, we had stories from Okeechobee and stories from Port St. Lucie. Port St. Lucie had 100 people get baptized last weekend. 100 people. And uh, two of them were these two brothers named Julian and Anthony, seven years old and 10 year old. And they had come to church about a month or so ago and they started hearing about baptism and Jesus. And they were like, we wanna be baptized. Well, for a kid to be baptized, the parents have to go with them through a class uh, called Starting Line. And so the parents went through the class with them and the, the parents actually got to lead their sons in the prayer of salvation to turn their life over to Jesus Christ. And so on the weekend when it was time to get baptized, uh, Julian and Anthony weren't the only two in their family that got baptized. The whole family, mom and dad, all of them got baptized. And their lives are being changed. They've done a 180. And they're just four of the 452 people that have given their lives to Jesus Christ since we opened up, up in Port St. Lucie. So I wanna thank all of you that helped us do the 180 challenge to help people do a 180. You're a part of Julian and Anthony's story, amen? So great. Also, before I jump into the teaching today, we're gonna to give our $1 offering. Can we do that before we, I'm afraid I'll forget if we don't do it. Uh, if you uh, were here the last couple of weeks, we told you to bring a dollar bill back with you. This is not our regular offering. This is our $1 offering. We'll do the regular one later. Ushers at all the campuses, you can come forward. Um, if you weren't here and you're like, what are you talking about a dollar offering? Well, couple, several weeks ago, we, um, I asked you to give a dollar and don't, don't give like a 50 because you'll mess up the whole thing. But, you can give a 10 for your whole row if you're doing that. Uh, 
And then you just had to trust me and we were able to take that and we did something really spectacular together down in Riviera Beach with that ministry. And so we've got something else planned for this week. So uh, somebody here, Angel, grab that. I'm gonna, I get to get in on it six times, six bucks. Also, uh, you gotta come back next week to find out what we're doing, right? So uh, you gotta come back. Also next week, uh, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be talking about the election. Woo, as if you haven't heard enough about the election already, right? But we're gonna be talking about it differently than how they're talking about it on CNN or Fox News or one of those, or we're, not, we're, we're gonna talk about it differently than how um, maybe your friends are even talking about it on social media because we're different. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We march to the beat of a different drummer, yep. We have a different perspective than what the world has. We are part of a heavenly kingdom. And so we're gonna talk together about what does God wanna say to his church as we're walking through this season? How are we supposed to be different and look different and talk different and act different and tweet different? How is that supposed to, we're gonna, it's gonna be in here tomorrow, I mean next weekend. So you gotta come back and uh, check that out in Jesus' name. Let me pray for us as we jump in uh, to, the, to the word for today. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the time we have together in your presence to, to praise and worship you, to, to look to the word of God today. I pray that your word would speak to every person here today. I know it will. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take um, the words of my mouth and that you would let them get planted into our hearts. And Lord, what I wanna share today, what I believe you put on my heart is um, so important to our lives. And it's bigger than me, so I pray that you would empower my mouth to be able to speak and give us ears, spirit, spiritual ears to hear, I pray today in Jesus' name, amen. Well, what I'm gonna to talk to you about today um, <clears throat> is something that you do. In fact, everybody does this. Doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, doesn't matter if you're raised a Baptist or a Buddhist, you do this. Doesn't matter if you're 32 or 72 or two, well, maybe not two, you do this. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're black or white, rich or poor, everybody does what we're gonna talk about today. So this should relate to everybody in this room today. Everybody joining us at all the campuses. Because here's what it is, everybody worships something. Everybody worships something. Something or someone will be number one in your heart. Something or someone will clamor for your devotion and for your attention. For some people, it's, uh, it's their career. They worship at the office six or seven days a week. You know, they're barreling down at the computer. That's what they do. Others, uh, it's, a, it's a relationship. Oh, they get in a relationship and all they can think about is that other person. Oh, my boo. Hey, boo. What's up, boo? <laughs> Texting boo, tweeting, all that. Um, for some people, it's, um, it's uh, a sport. Man, they, they are so enthralled by the sport. They might be on the the tennis court, the golf course, or just that's all they do is, and that consumes their life. It can be success, it can be money. Many people have different things that try to capture that number one place in their heart because we're all wired to worship. It's just in us, we're wired for it. In fact, I was watching TV uh, this past week and the mute button was on and I saw this and I thought, oh, it looks like a worship service at Christ Fellowship. Those are the young people jumping and at Easter we had banners or maybe that's Hillsong worship and I'm looking at these people and their hands are up in the air and they're getting emotional. I saw one guy crying. I'm like, what is going on? And then I turned the volume on and realized it was a Coldplay concert. <laughs> and I'm like, what, is, what does Coldplay have? What does Chris Martin, the lead singer, what has he got that, that makes all those people do that? And of course, if you turn TV on today or over the weekend, anytime during this season, you're gonna see people filling stadiums and they're, oh, 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 they're just gonna be waving their arms and jumping and shouting and getting crazy and painting their bodies, right? You're gonna see it. And we look at that and we go, those are fans. In fact, those are really good fans because they spent a lot of money to get in that stadium and cheer about a pig skin being moved up and down the field. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You see that, you, you say, That's, those are fans. But if you get excited about Jesus, whoa, 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 don't be fanatical. No, 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 it's okay to jump on down in a stadium, but it's okay to get excited about pigskin, but don't get excited about Jesus, right? Come on. We get into church, we get all sophisticated. Oh, well, well Todd, I'm just, I'm not emotional. Yeah, you were, I just saw you jumping up and down right there. <laughs> And by the way, here's what I know. Chris Martin, who's the lead singer of Coldplay, I'm sure he's a good guy. 
Uh, I'm sure that like Drake and Justin Bieber put on all these concerts. They're great people, but they don't know you. And they're not gonna be there for you when, when you're going through a rough place in your life. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna call you up and pray with you. They're not gonna do it, I promise. Jay Biebs, Bieber Baby, whatever you call him, <laughs> he ain't calling you back, Jack, right? Austin Appleby, the quarterback for the Gators, man. Uh, had a great game you know, against Georgia yesterday. Great, I'm sure he's a great quarterback. I'm sure he's a nice guy, but he doesn't know you. So when you're going through your dark place in your life, he's not gonna be there for you, but there is one. He knows you by name. Yeah, he knows everything about you. He's been with you every step along the way. He's heard every prayer that you've prayed. He says, when you walk through that fiery furnace, you're not gonna get burned up. I'm gonna be there, I'm gonna protect you. When you go through the difficult waters, they won't overtake you. I will bring you through. Child, you are mine. So I'm guessing if there's anybody we ought to get celebrating and maybe shouting about, it'd be the one that's gonna be there with us. Amen? Amen. 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 So. Now let me say this, there's nothing wrong about getting excited about a game. Nothing wrong, all you gotta do is go over to my dad's house every weekend, he's like woo, you know, it's okay. That's, you can paint your face up, you can do whatever you want, that's great, right? And there's nothing wrong with going to a concert and having a good time, right? Most concerts, there might be a few you shouldn't go to, but most concerts are probably okay. But, uh, but, but I'm just saying that if anybody's gonna get our praise, if anybody's gonna get our shout, if anybody's gonna get anything from me, it's gonna be Jesus Christ, amen? <laughs> So I got, I got one point for today's message. And you guys are already leaning in, right? You're already, here's the one point. Your praise is powerful. Your praise is powerful. So I want you to get, would you say it with me out loud? Your praise is powerful. There's power in your praise. So make sure you're giving it to the right person. Praise is defined as an expression of uh, admiration, an expression of gratitude, an expression of respect. That's, what, that's the definition of praise, it's an expression. So because the word expression was there twice, I looked up, well what is expression? Well expression is defined as the act of making known one's thoughts, feelings, or emotions. It's the act of demonstrating that, that's what it is. So praise, if praise is an expression, and expression is an act of making something known, then that means there's gonna be action. It's gonna mean it's gonna be impossible for you to really uh, praise God without some action involved in it, right? So uh, you know, I've heard people say before, um, well, you know, I'm just praising God in my heart. You know, God knows my heart. And I'm thinking, how would that work in your marriage, you know? If I just say to Julie, hey babe, I love you in my heart. I don't need to say anything. I don't need to, I don't need to get you flowers, I don't need to do it. No, are you kidding? That would not work very good in our home. Right, my love is expressed by me saying I love you, me opening up the car door, me calling her, texting her, hey baby, I love you, little, little smiley face with a kiss on it. I gotta send that to her every once in a while, right? It's an expression of my love to her. So sure, praise can originate in the heart, but if it's not expressed, it's not praise. So it needs to be expressed. So I wanna, the, the problem we've got is um, in the English language, we have one word for praise. It's praise. But in the original language, there's dozens of words that means praise, and they all demonstrate some different expression towards God. I don't have time to go over the dozens, but let me hit three of the most common ones that we find in the Bible. The first one is halal, halal. And this means to boast or celebrate clamorously. Woo! To look loudly, crazy, woo, getting crazy, right? It actually means like a party, that's what this is. And this is where we get the word hallelujah. Hallelujah, it's supposed to be a shout unto God. And look what it says in Psalm 113. It says, praise loudly the Lord. Yes, give praise clamorously, loudly, O servants of the Lord. Halal the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord now and forever. Everywhere you go, and from east to west, praise the name of the Lord. So that's why at church, sometimes we're, you'll hear a shout or a hoop or a holler, especially down here on the front when Angel gets excited. He's like, whoa, all right. That's Angel that's getting excited down here. And if you knew Angel's story, you know why he's getting so excited. But that's very biblical, right? A second very common word is yada. Yada means to extend your hand towards God or to worship with hands extended. And so when you come in, you'll see some people with their hands raised up in the air like they just don't care, right? Because we don't, we do that, we do. Uh, and you may grew up uh, and you didn't go to church or you went to a church that didn't raise their hands and you walked in and you're like, man, these people are crazy up in here. What, is, what are they doing, right? Um, 
We had one lady that came to church with a friend and she saw people with their hands in the air and she thought they had questions and that I was being rude because I wasn't answering. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but when you think about it, when a child or a baby raises its hands towards its parent, it's, what is it? it's wanting to be picked up. It's wanting to be uh, close to the parent or there's something that it needs and it knows that that mom or dad can give it. And so it's saying, I wanna be close to you. You think about um, uh, hands raised up in the air is a universal sign of surrender, I surrender. And so when we raise our hands towards God, we're saying all that to God. We're saying, God, I wanna be close to you. I wanna be closer to you than I am right now. And God, I need you, I need you in my life. And so I'm reaching out for you because I know you're my helper. And God, I surrender to you. I, I yield my life to your uh, leadership and your lordship over my life. So that's what we do when we yada. Some of you had never yadad before. And in just a few minutes, when we go back into worship, I'm gonna challenge you, if you've never yadad, to yada. And extend your hand. And you may just only be able to do this right here. That's okay. Just do it, just give it a go. It feels good, it feels good, it feels good, okay? There you go. And one third word that I wanna look at is called barak, and this just means simply to kneel. To, and this is a sign of humility before God. And it's in Psalm 95 that it says, come let us worship and bow down. Uh, let us barak before the Lord our maker. Now, why this is important is because when you halal and when you yada and when you barak, something powerful happens because your praise is powerful. And the first thing that I see that happens when we praise God is uh, your praise reminds you of who God is. When you praise and you start to declare what a powerful name he is, what a powerful name is, you have no equal, you have no rival. What you're doing is you're reminding yourself, that's right, God is supreme. God is in control. God is all powerful. You, you remind yourself, oh wait, it's okay. Hey, God's not freaking out about the election. Just let you know. He's not up in heaven going, oh, oh dear God, oh dear me. I, uh, <laughs> more emails, more emails, I didn't see that one coming. Oh, what are we gonna do? What if they, oh, 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 no, no. By the way, on November 9th, we will have a new elected president, but we will have the same king and his name is Jesus, amen? So we're okay, we're okay. So praise, praise actually reminds you who God is. Reminds you who Jesus is. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, that he's the friend of sinners. So no matter where you are in your life, he's your friend, right? And he's the friend that's closer than a brother. And so when we praise, it reminds us who he is and it reminds us of what he can do, that he has power over our problems, that there's no situation that's too hard for him. If he holds the universe in the palm of his hands, probably in the palm of one hand, he can take care of any problem that you might be up against. Even when everything seems out of control, there is one who is always in control. And praise actually forces your mind off of your problem onto the promises of God, off of the circumstance onto the Savior and the one who can actually do something about your circumstance. And I've said this before, but you cannot worship and worry at the same time. It's I've tried it, it doesn't work, right? You can't be going, you have no equal, you have no rival, and then be going, oh God, what am I gonna do? Oh, oh God, oh, it's awful, it's awful. No, because he's got it, he's got you, he is for you, so you can't be back and forth like that. So praise actually reminds you who God is, reminds you of what he can do, and I wanna tell you something. This, I, this is, a, this is a, a practice that I have to use all the time because I'm just like you, I got days, I have bad days, I have bad weeks, I have times when I'm discouraged, I have times when I'm upset because prayers aren't being answered the way I want them to be and I'm oh, kind of frustrated about that. I go through trials and temptation just like you do and what I have to do is get my mind off of whatever that is and on to Jesus. I got it. So I got praise and worship on my phone. Uh, yesterday, I had to put it, I have this little thing in my house I can send from my phone to the speaker and it plays to the house. I was just blaring it to the house. I was having a worship service, me and Jesus up in there because I had to get my mind off of where I was and get my mind on Jesus and so do you. It'll put your mind, and listen, this is, this is the only way that we can stay positive when everything around us is negative because you may be going through some negative things some negative uh, attack and things going on in your family or your business, but you don't have to let that negativity get on you. You can stay positive because you, are, you know the God who's over it all and got it under control. And this isn't fairy tale. This is, this is the greater reality, Amen. right? Because God was here before that problem was ever here, and God's gonna be here when that problem's all gone, and you're in God, so you're okay. 
You know what I'm saying? So the first reason that your praise is so powerful is because it reminds you of who God is and what he can do. The second reason your praise is so powerful is it actually, it actually releases the presence of God over your circumstance. You re, when you praise, you release the presence of God right into the middle of whatever you're in, right there. How do we know this? It says in Psalm 22, verse three, that God dwells in or inhabits the praises of his people. So when you praise God, you open up your mouth and you go, okay, I don't feel like it, but I'm gonna praise you. God goes, hey, I'm gonna show up right there. I'm gonna show up right there. I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna show up right. And when he shows up, he shows up right in the middle of it. He's in, the, the Bible, that verse actually translates, he's enthroned over the praises of his people. So when you praise him, he's enthroned. You establish him as the Lord or the king. He's enthroned over your family. He's enthroned over your finances. He's enthroned over that physical situation. He's enthroned over your business when you praise him that way, right? You enthrone, you invite his presence. And when you invite his presence, you invite his power. So when you open up your mouth, God's power shows up. And when God shows up, things are gonna change. The same power that, that raised Lazarus up from the dead shows up in your situation. It may look dead, it may smell dead, it may be dead. Hey, it's okay, God's God, he can raise it from the dead. Hey, you may, you may be dealing with a situation that looks completely impossible. The same power that made the Jericho walls crumble down just like that, man, God can make that problem crumble down just like that in Jesus' name. But you've gotta lift up the praise. Your praise can actually become a problem for your problem. Think about that, okay. I wanna look at a story that takes place in a, a book in the Old Testament called Second Chronicles just for a few minutes. And because of time, I'm gonna summarize the story and just read a few verses. But if you wanna encourage yourself in God, go read Second Chronicles chapter 20 and you'll read this story. It's a story of, of the people of God uh, under the leadership of King Jehoshaphat. So he was the king over the people of God at the time, and he gets a word that uh, he's being invaded by several armies that are all coming against him at the same time. Have you ever felt that way? Like something's coming against you, and it's coming at you from every angle. You got a battle over here, battle here, battle there, battle everywhere. I mean, they're just all around you. And he's completely outnumbered and overwhelmed. And so he turns to God in prayer, and basically his prayer is, oh God, right? Which is great that God hears our prayer when that's all we can get out, right? Oh God, help me. And then around verse 12, he says this, for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Say that last part with me out loud. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, God, it's, it's, it's impossible. We, we don't know how we're gonna get out of this one, God. We don't know how we're ever gonna make it through, but God, our eyes are on you. And I wanna tell somebody here today, you may feel like what you're up against is impossible. You may feel like you don't know what to do. You don't know how to hold the family together. You don't know how to make it through this next month with bills you've got stacking up. You don't know how you're gonna make it through with the medical report that you just got. I want you to know, you don't know what to do? Put your eyes on Jesus. When you don't know what to do, you gotta know where to look. You gotta look up, amen? Because when you're going through the storm, it matters where you're looking. If you're looking down and all around, you're gonna be tossed around by the storm. But if you look up and get your eyes up, where does your help come from? Your help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave God. And here's why, here's why this is hard for me. Because our human nature is that we, um, <laughs> we like to look at the problem. We like to study the problem, we like to analyze it. We have PhDs in problem solving, don't we, right? And so we talk about the problem, we lay in bed at night, oh, what if I, what, who caused the problem? Because I'm sure I didn't cause this problem all by myself, I bet, right? And we analyze, we think about it, we talk to our friends about the problem, and the Bible says don't do that. The Bible says stop that. Here's what the Bible says, look what it says in Psalm 105. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face, what's that word? Always. Yeah, look to the Lord and seek his strength, seek his face always, and in the original language, that means always. It means there's never a time that you can go, oh, I'm just gonna worry about the problem. No, 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 I'm gonna always look up. I'm gonna always see God. I'm gonna always, so what praise does is it changes your perspective. Cha praise takes your eyes off of the problem onto the promise and the hope of a savior that can solve the problem. Jehoshaphat uh, was praying this prayer. When he gets done praying this prayer, one of his men uh, comes up to him and has a word, has a word of prophecy that he wants to give him. It's from the Lord, and by the way, it matters who you have speaking into your life, you know that? 
It matters that you've got men and women of God that can actually get a word from God to speak into your life because all of us are gonna go through problems. All of us are gonna have trials in our life and I need people around me. They're gonna have a word from God. They're gonna speak from God. They're gonna hear. I got, I got guys in my small group, that bec- my, my group, because they, they walk with the Lord and they are in the word. When I'm going through something, they got a word for me. Pastor Sean will go, Todd, I got a word for you. I was praying for you this morning. Here's a word that God has for you. You need those kind of people in your life. Which is why we're telling you, you gotta get in a group here at church. You gotta get godly people around your life so you get the right voices, you can make the right choices. Jehoshaphat had the right voices. He had a small group, and one of his guys in his small group said, verse 15, listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Don't be afraid, don't be overwhelmed, Don't be discouraged. And we've talked many times about how fear will rob you of faith. Fear will always push out faith, but faith will always push out fear. They can't coexist. One will always push out the other. And I believe that one of the greatest weapons that the devil has against us is fear. It's one of his greatest weapons. Because if you listen to the voice of fear, you stop living in faith. You forget who you are, you forget who God is, you start worrying about the problem, it takes your eyes off God, it robs you of your joy, it robs you of your peace, and it ultimately pushes out fear. Fear, write this down somewhere, fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Julie and I were having dinner with a a mom and her four kids that were, uh, one was in college and a couple in high school, and uh, just in this last year, their life has been completely torn apart. Uh, The husband, her husband, their father abandoned them, wasn't providing for them, and here they are, ended up, they, they, she had to figure out how to get a job and get a house and how to take care of her kids, and some of them were getting ready to go into college, and she was just hearing the voices of fear over and over. You're not gonna make it. You're not gonna be able to provide for your kids. They're they're not gonna be able to go to college. You're not, they're not gonna have a father in their life, and all these things began to, and she realized she was listening to the wrong voice. And she was in her faith, she was losing faith. So she had to change who she was listening to. And she started to listen to what God said, that God said, I actually love your kids more than you do. I'm actually a God of a future and a hope for your kids. I got them covered. I got them in the palm of my hand. She kept getting them in church. She kept going around. And so a year later, she's walking in faith, strong in faith. God's given them a place to live. God's taking care of scholarships for his, their, her kids to get into college. God's got it covered. But she had to change who, where she was listening. Do you see what I'm saying? She had to remember, wait a minute, the battle isn't mine. The battle is the Lord's. And if you're in a battle today, you need to remember that. You need to know God is fighting for you. He's got you. He's he's gonna take care of you. You can trust him. So the guy says, the battle isn't, isn't yours, it's God's. But then he goes on in the next verse, verse 16, and says, tomorrow, you gotta march down against them. So wait, I'd be thinking if I was Jehoshaphat, I'm like, Lord, if the battle is yours, I'm just going back to bed. I don't wanna go out there. I'm gonna let you go do that thing that you need to do. But isn't it interesting how God always invites us into a divine participation with him? He wants you to step in and see up close and personal what he's getting ready to do. And so he invites you to stand in there. In fact, the next verse here says, go out and face the battle. Don't don't run from the battle. Some of you are in a battle. Don't run from it. Don't ignore it. Don't just hope it goes away. Man, stand your ground. Stand in the battlefield knowing who you are, knowing that you are a child of God, knowing that God is fighting for you, knowing that he's already given you victory. Amen? You're not fighting for victory. You're fighting from a place of victory. The Bible says you are more than a conqueror. You're already that, so walk in that. So Jehoshaphat goes, okay, we're gonna walk in that. And so he's getting a plan together. He goes, okay, what are we gonna do? And he prays about it. He says, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let the worship team lead the way. We're gonna put them out in front and the first thing that's declared is gonna be praise and worship to God. So all the worship leaders got out there in their skinny jeans with their ripped knees and they, they, <laughs> and they, uh, and they, uh, they let out in praise and here's what happened. Second Chronicles, verse 20, 22, says this. As they began to sing in praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir. They started fighting each other. And then after they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. How, how, God brought confusion on the enemy and they start killing each other. 
Did you know that your praise confuses your enemy? Your praise confuses your enemy. You start praising God, we're in the middle of a battle, and the devil's like, what are they doing? Like he's throwing his best at you and you're going, praise God. Come on, I'm a victor. God is for me. I have no weapon formed against me is gonna prosper. God, I'm gonna praise you no matter what I'm going through. And the devil's going, what is going on with him? If you choose, when you go through the battle, not to whine and complain and get depressed and get down and get killed, if you choose to look up and trust God, that, that just messes with the devil's head. He doesn't know what to do. In fact, it says in Psalm 8 that God has ordained praise to silence the foe and avenger. So praise actually silences your enemy. And that word silence, I've told you this before, the original language is the same root word for Shabbat, Sabbath. So when you start to praise God, the devil has to take a Sabbath, which means he can't do his work. He has to sit there and listen to you praise God. How good is that? So your praise is powerful. Come on, somebody. Your praise. I believe, write this down, your worship is a weapon. Your worship is a weapon. It says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that the weapons that we fight with are not carnal, which means they are not earthly, they're not limited, but they are supernatural weapons for the pulling down of strongholds. You've got a weapon in your worship, but if you don't pick that up and use it, it doesn't matter how powerful it is, it's not gonna help you fight the battle. So some of you are wondering why you're so beat up by life. Why are you being thrown around and tossed about and beat up this way? I mean, you need to praise God. You need to worship God. You need to change some of the music on those channels you're listening to and some of the things and start focusing on God and who he is and he will bring victory to your life and he'll bring blessing to your life. Because when they got to the battlefield, the enemy was all dead and it says here, all they had to do was carry off the plunder. It says there was so much plunder on the battlefield that it took three days for them to collect it all. Three days, so imagine. Every day they go down, the whole, all the, Judah comes down, they're gathering up, oh, I've got as much as I can carry. For three, I have to come back tomorrow. God, the very place that was gonna be a place of, of a panic, a place of problem for them, became a place of provision. Their enemy, God used their enemy to bless them. I believed as I was praying about this this weekend, that God's gonna use somebody's enemy in here to bless you. You're, you're gonna get blessed from the most unlikely source. God's gonna use the meanest person you know. And all of a sudden, there's gonna be a blessing that comes. You've seen it as a problem, and God's gonna say, I'm gonna actually provide through that person that you've seen as a problem. I'm gonna turn the situation around, and you're gonna see the hand of God work in a powerful way in your life. I believe it in Jesus' name. But what I want you to notice is this, and this is how I'm gonna wrap up this teaching. When did they start to praise? What was, it, was it after the battle was won? Was it after the enemy was defeated and they showed up and they're like, look at all the plunder, woo? No, they actually started to praise before the battle even began. They, they started to praise when they were completely outnumbered. They started to praise God before they had any real visible sign of victory. And I, I believe this is, this is what we need to hear today, okay, church? Many of us, we have no problem praising God when we see the victory. We have no problem praising God when the bills are paid and everybody's healthy and got that promotion, praise God, or you know, thank you God, you give me that spouse I'm praying for, Lord, and I'm gonna bless your name, Lord. We get all excited. We, we wait till after the good doctor's report and we, we think that's when we praise God, but that's not praise. That's actually thanksgiving because you're actually thanking God for what he's done. And that's important and we need to do that, but that's not praise. Praise actually gets on the front side. Praise. Praise isn't a byproduct of victory, it's actually a precursor to victory. Praise is actually when you declare, praise is actually faith being verbalized. It's actually, you're saying, God, I know you are my healer. So even before I see the good doctor's report, I'm gonna praise you that God, you wonderfully and fearfully made me. You know how to remake the things inside of me that need to be remade in Jesus' name. And so I praise you for that. God, I know that you're my provider. I declare that you are a good, good father. That's who you are. And so you're gonna care for me and you're gonna care for my children. And you praise him even before you see the bonus or the raise or the job. You praise him in advance and you are verbalizing your faith. That's what faith Faith is. Your praise is powerful. Your praise reminds you who God is. Your praise releases God's presence over your life and it does something in the heavenlies 
that all of hell doesn't know what to do with it when you begin to praise God. And so we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up our time here today on all of our services by, uh, by spending some time praising God. And for some of you, uh, it may be the first time you yada or barak and kneel in God's presence. But I believe that as you release praise into the heavenlies today, God will release something over your life because he inhabits your praise. And he'll be established over that situation or problem that you're dealing with today. So I'm gonna ask that everybody at all of our campuses stand together and um, just stay with us through this time. This is what this time is all about. Reach out to God today. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you that your word actually teaches us how we should think and how we should respond. And your word actually leads us to that place of victory today. And I pray the Lord that we, as we reach out for you, that we would see you reaching back for every person here, every situation. God, we surrender to you. We declare that you're our God. And, and in response to who you are and your loving kindness towards us, we raise our hands, we lift our voices to the one true living God. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Let's worship and praise together.